we're going to replace the stock Intel cooler with an Arctic Cooling Freezer 7 Pro Rev2. We have already removed the stock Intel cooler and cleaned the thermal compound off of the CPU as shown in Lesson 2. To unbox the Freezer 7 Pro, you need to turn it so you can see the specs on the back. There are three plastic fasteners, two on either side and one at the bottom. Once those are loose, you can separate the front from the back and slide the cooler out. Lift the cooler up and set it on its back to protect the pre-applied thermal compound. There is an Intel bag with push pins and screws, which we will be using. The AMD bag has two metal pieces and screws used for installing the cooler onto an AMD CPU. We won't be needing those, so I'll set them aside. The cooler comes with an Intel mounting plate. On each corner of the plate, there are three holes for push pins to go through the mounting plate and through holes in the motherboard. The holes closest to the center of the plate are used for installation onto a socket 775 motherboard. The middle holes are for socket 1156 motherboards, and the outer holes are for socket 1366 motherboards. We have a socket 1366 motherboard, so we will use the outer holes. I'll set the mounting plate onto the motherboard, so the outer holes are above the holes in the motherboard, and the screw holes on the mounting plate are facing the front and back of the computer. The push pins are in sets of two. The white, shorter one with the arrowhead looking tip goes through the mounting plate and motherboard. The other black push pin goes through the first and wedges the arrowhead outward to secure the mounting plate to the motherboard. The push pins are very small, so to make it easier, I will use needle nose pliers to insert them. The white, arrowhead shaped one first into the outer hole. Once it's partially in, I'll let go of it and use the pliers to push it down. I'll insert another white arrowhead shaped push pin into the opposite corner of the plate the same way, and then into the two remaining corners. Next, I'll get a grip on the head of the black spreader pin with my pliers and push it straight through the white arrowhead shaped pin. I'll do the same at the opposite corner from the first, and then the final two. The mounting plate is now secured to the motherboard. On the heatsink, the fan is covering up a screw hole we need to get to. The plastic fan is held to the cooler on each side using a notch in the metal cooler. I'll reach through the fan shroud and press outward to remove the fan from the cooler. Next, I'll lower the heatsink onto the CPU and mounting plate, making sure the direction of airflow from the cooler's fan is directed towards the rear exhaust fan. On one side of the cooler, Use your Phillips or plus screwdriver to pass the mounting screw through the hole in the cooler into the screw hole on the mounting plate. Get it started in the hole, but do not tighten it. On the other side of the cooler, do the same. And snug down the screw. Then go back to the other side and snug it down. Neither screw will tighten completely. You just want to feel some resistance. Next, I'll reattach the fan to the heatsink. And then insert the fan's power cable into the CPU fan header on the motherboard. That's it. The Freezer 7 Pro Rev2 is installed.
We are back in Windows after installing the new CPU cooler. I haven't changed any of the settings in the BIOS. We want to compare the temperatures with the new CPU cooler to what they were when the stock Intel cooler was installed. I'll open real temp. The CPU idle temperature is now 43 degrees C. The idle temperature with the stock Intel cooler with these same frequency and voltage settings was 62 degrees C. That's a 19 degree decrease in the temperatures at idle. Let's open Prime 95 and compare the load temperatures by running the large FFTs test. After 10 minutes, the load temperature is 75 degrees C. The load temperature with the stock Intel cooler was 97 degrees C. That's a 22 degree decrease in temperatures at load. This is very good and will give us more thermal room to overclock the CPU even higher. Let's try to get the CPU to 3.8 gigahertz. A base clock of 190 times a multiplier of 20 gives us 3800 or 3.8 gigahertz. Once again, the RAM, Uncore, and QPI changed automatically. The RAM changed to 1143 megahertz, which is well below the RAM's rated speed of 1333 megahertz. The Uncore is at 2286 megahertz, which is twice the speed of the RAM, and the QPI is at its lowest possible setting. We want to see if these new frequency settings will work with the current voltage settings, so I won't make any changes to the voltages. I'll make note of the settings, press F10, and enter to save and exit. We've just entered Windows, and there's an error in Windows Explorer. This is a possible sign of an unstable overclock. Explorer just reloaded itself. Let's open real temp. The idle temperature is 44 degrees C. I'll start up Prime 95 and use the small FFT setting this time. The small FFT setting puts more stress on the CPU. The computer froze and it restarted itself. Prime 95 had been running for about 8 minutes and the temperature was 78 degrees C. We need more voltage to make the system stable at 3.8 gigahertz. To make the overclock stable at 3.7 gigahertz, we increase the CPU PLL to 1.88 volts and the QPI DRAM voltage to 1.225 volts which didn't seem to affect the stability of the overclock. The system still froze and restarted after these two increases. It wasn't until we increased the CPU voltage to 1.25 volts that the overclock became stable. The QPI DRAM voltage increase wasn't needed because of the low RAM and uncore frequencies. Again, if you have 1600 MHz RAM, continue to follow along as if you have 1333 MHz RAM. We will address 1600 MHz RAM later in this lesson. We're going to leave the CPU PLL voltage and the QPI DRAM voltage where they are and increase the CPU voltage to 1.275 volts. I'll make note of the change, press F10, and enter to save and exit. Let's check real temp. The CPU idle temp is 44 degrees C. I'll start Prime 95 on the small FFT setting again. Prime 95 has been running for 15 minutes and the load temperature is 82 degrees C. The overclock appears to be stable. I'll close Prime 95 and run burn in test on the CPU coverage setting for more confirmation of a stable overclock. It passed.
I'll run 3D Mark 6 for a further confirmation of stability and to get the CPU score. At 3.8 GHz, the CPU score in 3D Mark 6 is 7082, so the CPU is stable at 3.8 GHz. Let's try to get the CPU to 3.9 GHz. A base clock of 195 times a multiplier of 20 gives us 3900, or 3.9 GHz. The RAM, Uncore, and QPI changed automatically. The RAM changed to 1173 MHz, which is fine. The Uncore is 2346 MHz, which is twice the speed of the RAM, and the QPI is at its lowest possible setting. Once again, we want to see if these new frequency settings will work with the current voltage settings, so I won't make any changes to the voltages. I'll make note of the settings, press F10, and enter to save an exit. Let's check real temp. The CPU idle temperature is 44 degrees C. I'll start Prime95 on the small FFT setting. The system just froze. and the computer restarted itself. Prime 95 was running for about two minutes and the temperature was around 80 degrees C. I'm going to increase the CPU voltage to 1.3 volts and test again for stability. F10 and enter to save an exit. Let's check real temp. The CPU idle temperature is 45 degrees C. I'll start Prime 95 on the small FFT setting. The computer just froze. And it restarted itself. I'm going to increase the CPU voltage to 1.325 volts and test again for stability. Let's check real temp. The idle temperature is 45 degrees Celsius. I'll open Prime95 and run the small FFT setting. Prime 95 has been running for 17 minutes, and the temperature is 90 degrees Celsius. The overclock does seem stable. I'm going to close Prime 95 and run burn-in test. On the CPU coverage setting to confirm the stability. It passed. I'll close down burn-in test. I'll run 3D Mark 6 for a further confirmation of a stable overclock and to get the CPU score. The CPU score at 3.9 GHz is 7163. The overclock to 3.9 GHz is stable. However, the voltage increases required to make the overclock stable have pushed the CPU temperatures to 90 degrees C, which is not recommended over extended periods. We had to increase the CPU voltage from 1.275 volts to 1.325 volts to achieve stability at 3.9 GHz. That is a total increase of 0.05 volts. This is only 0 0.075 volts below the maximum safe voltage of 1.4 volts. Let's try to get the CPU to run at 4 GHz. A base clock of 200 times a multiplier of 20 gives us 4000. 
or 4 GHz. The RAM, Uncore, and QPI changed automatically. The RAM changed to 1203 MHz, which is fine. The Uncore is 2406 MHz, which is twice the speed of the RAM. And the QPI is at its lowest possible setting. Taking into account the amount of voltage required to increase the frequency from 3.8 GHz to 3.9 GHz and keep the overclock stable, we will need most of the remaining 0.075 volts to stabilize the overclock at 4 GHz. I'm going to be fairly aggressive and set the CPU voltage to 1.39375 volts and test for stability. This computer is in a closed desk. To help out with the cooling, I'm going to open the door to allow cool air in. Let's check real temp. The idle temperature is 40 degrees C. I'll start Prime 95 on the small FFT setting. The computer hasn't frozen and is still running, but one of the worker windows in Prime 95 has stopped, saying there was an error. So the CPU is not stable at 4 GHz with the current voltage settings. When I attempted to restart the computer to go into the BIOS, I got a blue screen, and this is it. On your computer, whenever you're overclocking and it becomes unstable, you may get a blue screen like this. Whereas usually on my computer here, it would freeze and then restart itself. Any kind of freeze, um, restarting, blue screen, error message are all signs of an unstable overclock. I'll go ahead and restart and go back into the BIOS. I'm going to increase the CPU voltage one more time. I'm just going to highlight the CPU voltage and press the plus key on the keyboard, which brings it up to 1.4 volts, which is the maximum safe voltage according to Intel. I'll press F10 and OK to save and exit. Let's check real temp. The idle temperature is 42 degrees C. I'll open Prime95 on the small FFT setting. One of the cores is spiking to 100C, which is causing the safety mechanism on the CPU to lower the multiplier, dropping the speed to 3.9 GHz. The system may be stable with the 1.4 volt setting. We would need a water cooler on this CPU to keep the temperatures down below 100C to know for sure. We're out of thermal headroom, so we won't be able to overclock this CPU to 4 GHz with any certainty of stability. I'll go ahead and stop Prime 95. This is one of the earlier Core i7s. It was purchased about a month after they hit the street in late 2008. If you have a more recent version of the Core i7, you may be able to overclock to 4 GHz or higher. I say a more recent version because all CPU designs go through steppings and revisions. The more recent revision CPUs are usually easier to overclock because at any given speed, the voltage required is lower for the CPU to run stably. For example, an earlier revision CPU like this one might need 1.4 volts to the CPU cores to run stable at 4 GHz, whereas the latest, newer revision CPU may only require 1.3 volts to run stably at that same frequency. This is true for both Intel and AMD CPUs. To find the stepping and revision on your CPU, go to www.cpuid.com and download the latest version of CPU-Z. Get the EXE, save it, install it, and run it. Our CPU stepping is 4, and the revision is C0, C1. You will often find the revision being referred to as the stepping by hardware reviewers and other users online. Later numbers and letters are more recent. D0 is newer than C0, and D1 is newer than D0. We will go more into CPU steppings and revisions in the 2010 Home PC Builder videos. Suffice it to say,
that a CPU with a more recent stepping and revision is almost always better at overclocking than an older stepping or revision CPU. The Core i5 CPUs, which are very closely based on one of the more recent Core i7 designs, may overclock easier as well. If you actually have 1600 MHz RAM and have been following along to find your maximum CPU core overclock, which may be lower or higher than ours, you can go into the BIOS and move the RAM speed up a notch. If your base clock is currently 195, the next notch up will be 1563, which is just below the rated speed of your RAM. If your base clock is currently 200, the next notch up will be 1603 MHz, which is a very small overclock of the RAM and should not be an issue. When you make that change, the uncore frequency will jump from its current speed of 2406 MHz to 3208 MHz. This is a sizable overclock that will almost certainly introduce instability. This is when you need to increase the QPI DRAM core voltage to stabilize this new overclock. Start by increasing the QPI DRAM voltage to 1.3 volts and use Prime95 on both the blend and small FFT setting along with the RAM and CPU coverage tests and burn-in test to check for stability. If the overclock is stable, you can decrease the QPI DRAM voltage one notch at a time, testing for stability with each decrease until you find the minimum voltage that produces a stable overclock. If the overclock is not stable with the QPI at 1.3 volts, you can increase the voltage one notch at a time and test for stability to find the minimum voltage that produces a stable overclock. Once you have your final maximum stable settings, you need to think about a few things. Did you have to increase the voltage a little too much to get that 0.1 GHz speed improvement? Are the temperatures a little above the recommended levels? Is that 0.1 GHz speed improvement worth shaving off a year of your CPU's life, or having your CPU fan spin too fast, making your otherwise quiet computer a little too noisy? In my case, I'm going to lower the CPU speed down to 3.7 GHz. It required only a 0.05 volt increase of the CPU voltage from the stock setting to run stable at that speed. And with the new cooler, the load temperatures were in the low 70s. Our RAM is rated to run at 1333 MHz. I would like to see if we can get it to run even faster than we did in Lesson 4. In Lesson 4, we had the base clock set to 175 which gave us an overclocked RAM speed of 1403 MHz, which was stable. With our current base clock of 185, the RAM speed is now 1113 MHz. The next speed up is 1483 MHz. I'll make that change and test for stability. We haven't changed the CPU overclock, so the temperatures should not change. I'm going to run Prime95 on the blend setting to test the memory, and I'm also going to run burn and test on the RAM setting at the same time. This will put a lot of stress on the RAM. It passed the RAM test, and Prime95 has been running for 15 minutes. So the RAM overclock to 1483 MHz is stable. The next step up in RAM speed is 1854 MHz, which would most certainly fail, so I'm not going to try. If the tests failed or the system restarted with the RAM set to 1483 MHz, there are two things I could try. The first would be to increase the DRAM bus voltage. You need to be very careful here and not push it too far. I checked with the manufacturer and my memory can take up to 1.6 volts.
I would then test for stability. If the test still failed, I could increase the memory timings using the DRAM timing control. At the top of the page, the default timings for my memory are shown. With the settings at Auto, the timings are at their default settings. The first four are the ones that can make a difference in stability. I would change the first three settings to 10. and the fourth setting to 30. This will give the memory more time to make its reads and writes. If the test still failed after these settings changes, I would just have to set them back to default. And set the DRAM frequency back to 1113 MHz. Any further increase in the timings would slow the RAM down too much and make the speed increase pointless. My RAM did work at the default settings, so I will leave it set to 1483 MHz. The only other thing to do is to turn back on the power saving features. The C1E support, speed step, and C state tech. I'll save and go back into Windows. In real temp, we can see that when the CPU is idle or under very light load, the CPU multiplier is lowered, making the CPU frequency lower. If we use Prime95 to give the CPU something to do, the multiplier jumps back up to 20, making the CPU run at 3.7 GHz, giving us full performance. If we stop Prime95, the multiplier immediately lowers into power saving mode, lowering the energy used, lowering the electricity bill, and prolonging the life of your CPU. I think that's it. If there is anything about these lessons you didn't understand, need to know more about, or if you think I'm just plain wrong about something, please email me at help at homepcbuilder.com or call toll-free 866-508-1113 to let me know.